good-ish. Awesome. All right, so I want to start out. We're running a little bit late on time, but just some basic questions. So how many people here can speak uh, more than one language? <laughs> No surprise there. All right, now how many people in the audience have studied linguistics uh, in any? All right, so a lot of you, but not all of you, right? So that's an interesting question, right? So why are linguistics and language learning so separated when they have so much to do with each other? Um, in a lot of ways, linguistics as an academic subject can seem very, uh, well, it can just seem not relevant to language learning, right? It can often seem very mathy or rule-based or just too abstract to, uh, to really be interested in getting into. So today I want to talk about uh, one field, or one specific subfield of linguistics in which language learning uh, makes you essentially a, a perfect candidate to explore. So I'm going to talk about the Indo-European language family. Has anyone heard of that before? <laughs> so not all of you, that's great. All right, so uh, unfortunately a lot of this stuff is a little bit technical, right? I'm, I'm going to try and go through that technical stuff as quickly and as easily as possible. Um, but we do need to build uh, a couple basic tools to understand the fun stuff we're going to be looking for. Um, right, so basically, and I want you guys to participate as much as possible. Uh, so, right, so what, what makes a language family, right? When we say two languages are related, what exactly do we mean? As Keanu Reeves wants to know, right? Can someone shout out basic idea? Why, what would make two languages related to one another? What does that mean? Shared words. Okay, I heard shared words. Now that's interesting. What a coincidence. <laughs> All right, so if two languages have words in common, yeah, okay, I've heard that a lot, right? Someone says, oh, well, the word for a book in Swahili is kitab, in Arabic it's kitab, they must be related, right? Let's look at a few things. Um, anyone know a language called Mbaram? It's obscure, it's from Australia, it's an Aboriginal language, right? Mbaram has a word, dog. Does anyone know what that means? No way! <laughs> All right, here's another one. Uh, Turkish has a suffix abil or ebil, like konuşabiliyorum, görebiliyorum, whatever. Anyone know what that means? No way! <laughs> All right, last one. In old Japanese, uh, we have this character, which would have been pronounced something like womina. Anyone know what that means? No way. <laughs> All right, so that's one of the first pitfalls in talking about our languages related because they have shared words, right? Obviously, English is not genetically related to any of these guys, as far as we know, right? There are simply so many sounds in the human mouth, so many hundreds or thousands of languages out there that you're bound to get uh, similarities like this just by complete chance. But moving on then, what about if you have so many words in common, it just looks like, well, obviously this isn't an accident, right? So look at Swahili and Arabic, as I mentioned earlier. Right, this is a case where they have a lot of the same words, but they're not genetically related, right? They don't come from the same original language. Swahili is Bantu, Arabic is Semitic, and yet they have all these shared words because of borrowing, right? So that's another way, uh, another thing we need to keep in mind talking about genetic relations, right? Languages can borrow from one another. You also have this. Anyone know what this kind of word is as a? Right, okay, so you got words like bam, ding, ow, achu, etc., right? That, again, are pretty universal in a lot of languages, sound very similar. But we can't really use that as a, as a litmus test for seeing if they're related. Perhaps in, included in this group would also be the universality of the word mama, right? Which isn't because of any genetic relation, it's because, most likely, babies can say M as one of their first sounds. Right, okay, so moving on, uh, how do we tell if languages are related, then? We might look to, all right, so we're not going to do shared words, right? That's dumb. <laughs> so look at this guy. Anyone know who this is? No way! <laughs> right, okay, so William Jones, um, your classic, stuffy, British white guy. Um, actually not a very good person if you read about him, but not relevant here, right? So he was uh, a judge in the East India Company in India, and he started learning Sanskrit, right, which is an ancient language from India, to try and understand sort of the roots of Indian culture, Hinduism. Uh, and in doing so, he noticed something pretty bizarre. Does anyone know this story? Go for it. Right, perfect, right? So Jones, as a guy of his day, would have known Latin and Greek, being a classically educated uh, man in a wig, right? And uh, he makes this address on February 2nd of 1786, which most people mark as the beginning of Indo-European linguistics. You don't need to read the whole quote. But basically he says, look, I've looked at Latin, and I've looked at Greek, and I've looked at Sanskrit, and it's, it's insane how much these words look like one another. In fact, they look so similar that this can't be due to chance, right? It, this has to be due to some common source, which perhaps doesn't exist anymore. So he's the first person, he's not the first person to say this, but he gets all the credit for it, right? Uh, these guys must have come from some common ancestor. Now, what was that, right? How do we find that? So let's think about it, right? How do we find 
Jones is common, uh, common source for all these languages in Europe. We've got to go back, basically. <laughs> if anyone's a Back to the Future fan. Right, okay, so one way we might do this is to look for regular similarities between languages. So let's try this, right? In English, we have the word foot. Does anyone know what it is in Greek, Latin, Sanskrit, etc.? No way, all right. More, right, father, boom. Interesting, we're starting to see some patterns maybe. Right, again, full. Same stuff, right? Again with another word, fire. Doesn't exist in Sanskrit with this root. Uh, Umbrian is a language related to Latin that has a word peer for fire. Right, so what, what patterns are we seeing here? Exactly, right? So we see that there's an alternation between F and P, which is pretty curious. And it looks like it's regular. It looks like it's happening everywhere, right? Everywhere English natively has an F, these guys are gonna have a P. So most likely these are from a shared origin, right? We can say that not only because of that, but look at the other forms of the words, right? We have a T at the end of foot and a D sound in these other guys, or the R at the end of father and all these other guys, right? It's too much just to be a coincidence. So then if these came from a common origin, how might we reconstruct that? So the question then is, was the original sound an F that then became a P in these three other guys, or was it originally a P that became an F in English? You can make the argument it's not really clear from this, right? Maybe Sanskrit, Greek, and Latin all came from a subfamily that had one mutation and we came from a different one. Unclear. But let's look at a bigger picture of other languages in this family, right? So to determine which sound change this is, let's see. So we have foot. Anybody know a Slavic word that sounds kind of like this? Doesn't mean foot. Yeah, there you go. Right, but under, curious, in Russian. We might look to another language family called Anatolian, which is the earliest attested Indo-European uh, language. It's from ancient Turkey. In a language called Hittite, their word for foot is pata, or pada, right? Same idea, we're seeing this P again. You can guess where I'm going from here, right? Again and again and again, we're seeing P. In Persian, for example, the word for full is pur. In Lithuanian, it's pilnas, right? These, these occurrences happen everywhere and so regularly that uh, we can be pretty sure at this point that the original sound was a P, right? Just statistically speaking, there are too many languages that have P and only one small group that have F to say that the original sound was F, right? So this is the beginning of what's called the comparative method. Uh, the comparative method briefly was established uh, by a group of German scholars at the end of the 19th century, and they're called the Neo-Grammarian School, which is an awful title, but um, they started regularly, they started studying the regular correspondences in Indo-European languages to try and find what their genetic relatedness was, right? So this leads to uh, this absolute catastrophe of a phrase, die Ausnahmslosigkeit der Lautgesetze, right? The literally the, uh, whatever, exceptionlessness of sound changes, or the regularity of sound change. So one empirical fact that they discovered by analyzing all these languages worldwide was that when a sound changes in one position, it changes in all positions. So you'll never have an English word that has an F where Sanskrit has a P, but also in English sometimes it'll switch to a P as well, right? If it's gonna be F, it's gonna be F everywhere. If it's gonna be P, it's gonna be P everywhere. That's regular. Right? And that's a huge, huge point in understanding how historical linguistics works. So again, the comparative method, right, comparing data from daughter languages to try and rebuild uh, a structure of what the original language was, is not perfect, right? It can only go back uh, maybe about 3000 BC, 4000 BC, et cetera. It also has other problems, but it's pretty good for what we're doing. So to understand then again the concept of genetic relatedness, you look for something called shared innovations basically. Right, so to show this, let's look at these guys again in English. Uh, anyone know the German word for foot? All right, shout them out. Next. 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 So what do we see again? Anybody who doesn't speak German, the V's are pronounced as F's, right? So German, German has all of these Fs as well where Sanskrit and Greek should have a P. That's kind of curious, isn't it? So it's not just English, right? There's another language very near us which also has this. Does anyone here know Gothic? It's, uh, it's, uh, right, Gothic is the first attested Germanic language, I think from the three or four hundreds AD. Uh, there's an early translation of the Bible in it. Either way, Gothic, which is also in this language family, boom, you get Fs everywhere. So this is what we'd like to call a shared innovation, right? At some point, the, the pre-ancestor of English, German, and Gothic changed a P to an F. And as sort of a diagnostic, if you get Fs in all those positions, there's a good chance it's a Germanic language, right? All right, so moving on. So the comparative method. So now we've seen sort of how this works between separate uh, languages that are living, right? But how do we reconstruct this to get a picture of what the original language was? Right, because it's clear it was never written down. We can't, we don't have any actual uh, orthographic evidence of it. Right, so the comparative method moving on 
Uh, this is a, a good example of it, right? So in Greek, we have the word uh, tres for three. By the way, when I say Greek here, it's ancient Greek, right, in the Attic dialect, not modern Greek. Um, earlier it, in inscriptions, it's written as tres, right, with two syllables. Latin has tres, and Sanskrit in India has trias, right? So I'm ask you guys, uh, what do we assume about the proto word, do you think? It started with what? T and R, right? And what do you think it ended in? Good call. You're so smart. So, um, <laughs> right, and you put the little asterisk there to show that that's a, a reconstructed term, right? We, it, it's not attested anywhere, but we think this is what it looked like. Okay, so the T and R, S make sense, right? Because if there were no S there, we'd have to say, well, the S evolved independently in Greek and Latin and Sanskrit, which is statistically pretty bizarre, right? But uh, the question then is, what do we do about the vowels? All these guys have different vowels. Right, okay, so one universal fact, or one almost universal fact in languages is that generally if you have two uh, short vowels, they can collapse together into one giant long one. Right, that's pretty regular. So we might say based off of that, that Latin has an innovation, right? They've changed what that original vowel was. Because Latin is just one giant long one, which most likely came from two, uh, two, two separate vowels earlier. Right, also the Greek and the Sanskrit forms have two vowels or more. So by that same logic, we might say that Greek also has a shorter sequence which derives from a longer one, right? Because tre s, if Sanskrit has a y in there, it'd be pretty rare for them to just randomly insert an extra vowel in, right? That almost never happens. So we can assume probably that Greek, again, collapses what were originally three sounds into two, Latin collapses as two, into one. So we have a form like this, most likely, right? So there's gonna be a y in between based off of the Sanskrit evidence. We don't know what the vowel is, right? Could it be treas, is it trias? We can't really tell from this. But let's look at more data now. Right, Greek and Latin both have an E here, right? Esti and est. Anyone know what this word is in Sanskrit? Asti, there you go, it's the verb is, right? Uh, moving on, so where Greek and Latin have an A, agros, ager, field, what will Sanskrit have? Aitra, with an A, same idea again, right? Last one, where Greek and Latin have octo, eight, what will Sanskrit have? Ashti. So basically, we can sum that up this way, right? Everywhere Greek and Latin have an E, Sanskrit's gonna have an A. Everywhere Greek and Latin have an A, Sanskrit will also have an A. Everywhere there are two O's, Sanskrit will have an A. <laughs> <laughs> so what does that mean, though, right? Well, if we're looking at a principle of the regularity of sound change, we can't really posit an original A for that first proto word, right? Because if we were to say that, we'd say, okay, an A becomes an A in Sanskrit, no problem. Sometimes, though, in Greek, it becomes an E. Sometimes it's an A, sometimes it's an O. That violates our principle that sound change is regular, right? So we have to assume that this Sanskrit A is an innovation, that originally there were an E, an A, and an O in the proto-language that then collapsed into something different in Sanskrit. So keeping with that, we can reconstruct our proto-word for three as treyes, which is pretty cool. Or not. <laughs> right? So. This is just one very basic example of the method, and this is a relatively simple one. But you can do this to reconstruct entire uh, grammatical forms, right? Conjugations of verbs, uh, words for material culture, et cetera. And uh, we're gonna walk a little bit around that now, or sorry, in a second, but I wanna ask just briefly, right? How does sound change work? What are some basic ways that sounds can change in language? There's one simple one called analogy, right? Which also works more on verbs, but, or, nouns, et cetera, something called morphology, but it can also do it with sounds. So analogy, what's, uh, what's the Russian word for nine? Anyone know? Nyevyet. Right, which is kind of weird. Anyone think that's weird? You know why? Right, okay, it's not nyevyet or something like that, which is odd because everything else in the Indo-European family, right, language related to Russian, have an N there. So why should Russian deviate from the rest of the crew? Does anyone know? There you go. Exactly, right? So the word for 10 in Russian is dziesiet. So at some point, the proto-Slavs were thinking, okay, we might say nievit or something like that, but actually we want to make it sound more like 10. So we're going to call it dziesiet to match dziesiet after it. Same thing happened in English, right? Our original, our word four is an, is an analogy with five, right? Five started with an F, four started with something else. We changed it. That's the idea behind analogy here. So that's one way that a sound system could change. Right. Secondarily, something called allophones become full-fledged phonemes. So a phoneme is essentially the mental representation of a word in your head. Right? An allophone is how it's actually expressed when you speak it. So here's a basic example, right? Someone say these three words. Right, so you might not notice it, but actually that T is pronounced differently in all three spots, right? Top, top has an aspirated uh, puff of air to it, right? Stop is, is voiced almost, it almost sounds like a D, it sounds like a stop, right? And spot, it's complete closure, right? You don't breathe out, you might even turn it into a glottal stop, like spa, right? So you don't realize that, right? You don't treat those three T's as independent sounds, you just treat them all as T, 
right? But if there were a couple more sound changes in English, it could be the case one day that that T in top and that T in stop could become uh, independent phonemes the way that P and B are for us today. So as an example of this, right? Uh, in Old English, the word for uh, foot was fought, right? And to make the plural, you turn it into fought E. Now in the process, right, uh, that O vowel shifted forward in the mouth. So instead of foti, it became ferti. So you had a distinction, foot is fought, feet are ferti, something like that, right? Uh, fine, and this er is an allophone, right, in the sense that they didn't recognize it as an independent sound, if that makes any sense. So what happens later? Well, the E drops off, so suddenly you have, uh, you have fought and fert for the plural. Uh, so what happens there is because that er is the only sound that distinguishes the two words, it becomes a phoneme in its own right. It gets introduced into the sound system, and uh, that changes the way that the sound system is organized, basically. This is also where we get foot versus feet today, right? That foot became fate, became feet. Right, so this is a little technical, but bear with me. Um, again, another way you can get a sound change is through chain shifts. So uh, when late Latin was turning into the original, uh, the Spanish language today, right, you had a shift where double K in Latin, it's called a geminated K, went to a single K. So something like buca became Spanish, right, mouth. So what happens then? You have more Ks than you had earlier. So the Ks in the language are gonna switch to something else. The Ks in Latin switch to Gs. So amica in Latin becomes Right, okay, now you have the problem, you have more Gs where there are other Gs, right? So those original Gs in the language disappear. So you get Latin regina, queen, which becomes Spanish. Right, so this is another way that a sound system in a relatively short amount of time can sort of rearrange itself. Okay, so this brings us to this bigger picture of languages, right, of interrelated languages. So all these guys down here are linked via shared innovations, right, sound changes that they share with other parts of their family. Now this looks like uh, this is not even all of them, by the way. There are literally hundreds that are not on here. But you get the basic point, right? This is a huge family of languages. And there's been a lot of research in the last 200 years as to how they all relate to one another. Um, so I promise this is still, we're gonna get to the fun stuff very soon. This is not fun <laughs> already. But um, so through this work of comparing languages, right? Comparing words like three or father or whatever, we can reconstruct words pretty confidently in this mother language, right? So let's see. We can reconstruct a word for a wheel. Don't worry about these subscripts like the W, right? We'll explain that in a little bit. But uh, queklo is a reconstructed word for wheel, which has, through regular sound change, cognates in a bunch of other languages. In Sanskrit, chakra, Lithuanian, kuklos, which is your neck, right? English, whale, which gives us our wheel. Greek, kuklos, like Ku Klux Klan, I don't know. Um, <laughs> the same thing here, right? So nechus, ignore the H2, we'll talk about that in a little bit right, uh, has cognates in all these other Indo-European languages as well. And by establishing the regular sound correspondences, we can rebuild a picture of what this original word was. Again, same thing. These guys were crazy about drinking, it seems. Um, specifically because a lot of times you see a word, it'll have cognates in maybe Greek or German, but not all of them. This one, I think, shows up in every single family except for Albanian, which is pretty big, right? So it gives you Russian myot, uh, Icelandic myother, Old Irish mead, Sanskrit madhu, right? It's a pretty popular thing. So the fact that this means either honey or sweet honey alcoholic beverage in all these languages points to the fact that whoever the original family of speakers was had this. So what does this mean, right? This actually allows us to identify who the Proto-Indo-Europeans were in space and time to a certain degree, right? Because now we have physical attestations of what their material culture was like. But it goes a little bit beyond that, right? So we can also reconstruct a word for cattle, something like pecu, right? Which gives us Latin pecu and later pecunia, pecuniam, right, money. Uh, Ossetian, which is an Iranian language from the Caucasus, it has fis for sheep, Germanic has fi, right? Which became our word fi. You can see again the P and the F alternation, right? The Latin has a P, ours has an F. German also has an F there. Moving on from there, we can reconstruct a word for a yoke, which is a pretty esoteric uh, thing, but it's this piece of wood you put between two oxes, right? So it becomes Russian yugo, Dutch yuk, Sanskrit yuga, Hittite in ancient Anatolia, yukon, right? The correspondences are so regular that it's, it's, it's kind of shocking at first. You think these languages aren't related at all. And again, maybe we can reconstruct words for other animals, right? Lakso could be salmon from German lachs. There's another word in Russian that sounds somewhat like it. Uh, we've reconstructed a word for a bear, hrtkos, something like that, which would have been, which gives us uh, Sanskrit, sorry, Greek arktos or Hittite harktos. You don't need to get caught up on the details here, but basically we have evidence for material culture and we have evidence for uh, agriculture and for animals, among a lot of these other things, right? So we can theoretically try and locate where these guys were, right? They weren't living in the Middle East if they had bears and whatever, things like that. Um, so this is the prevailing hypothesis in, in linguistics, right? It's called the Kurgan hypothesis. Essentially that 
These guys were somewhere in southern Russia, and then they spread out, some of them going all the way to western China, to Xinjiang, uh, also to India, to ancient Turkey. There are other hypotheses, but this is the most uh, accepted one, essentially. Right? So this, this piece of land as well, right? it looks like it has the first evidence of chariot use, of wheels, uh, the environment we can perhaps reconstruct through words like bear or salmon or birch tree or et cetera, which is pretty cool. It's also named the Kurgan hypothesis because of some mysterious ancient culture that left uh, what are called Kurgans, essentially, which are giant uh, uh, earthen mounds that uh, had a burial in it. So what else do we know about these guys? They seem to have been obsessed with the idea of fame, right? <laughs> As Kanye is. So we can reconstruct a word for fame that looks something like kleos, right? This gives you uh, a bunch of words, but the really interesting thing is that if you look at ancient poetic texts, right, in the Iliad and in the Rig Veda, one of the oldest texts in Hinduism, you have this phrase that uh, they're cognate with one another, right? If you follow the sound changes, these two both came from the same root. Uh, so kleos aftiton in Homer is a phrase, you hear Achilles say it a couple times in the Iliad. It means uh, imperishable fame. You see it also in the Rig Veda, shrava akshatam, means the exact same thing. Right, so the idea that we can reconstruct a common poetic vocabulary speaks to the fact that this was probably in the mother language as well, which is pretty cool, right? These guys never wrote anything down. We don't even know exactly where they were, but we can reconstruct huge amounts of their ancient culture using data from modern languages. It also shows up a lot in names. So there's a, an old Russian named Boleslav, right, having greater fame, or a Greek Themistocles, right, law fame. You see this showing up a lot in names. We also see that these guys were obsessed with horses. And when I say obsessed, I mean obsessed. Um, so we can reconstruct a word for horse, right? Hekwos or something like that, which gives us Greek hippos, Latin equos. Uh, in the language from ancient China, Tocharian, it gives us yakwe, gives us Sanskrit ashva, aspa in Avestan from ancient Iran, etc. cetera. Right? Um, what's interesting here is that these guys clearly had horses in their culture. They also had wheels, which means they most likely had chariots, right? Uh, in addition to that, we see some very bizarre things going on in cultural traditions from across the ancient world and relating to horses. So anyone know what the Ashwamedha was in ancient India? Exactly, right? So there was a sacrifice where a king, if a king was being coronated or wanted to renew his reign, he would sacrifice a horse. And if I remember correctly, it was supposed to be a female horse, a white mare that was on the right side of a chariot. Uh, interestingly enough, in ancient Rome, you see the same thing, something called the October Equus, where the, in the early kings, they did this as well. They would sacrifice a white mare that was on the right of a, of a yoke or of a chariot. There's also interesting evidence uh, from a, a text called the Topography of Ireland, which was written by a Welshman about a thousand years ago, where he talks about a savage practice among Celts in Ireland, where the king would uh, bathe in a horse's blood, a white horse's blood, to renew his reign. Um, so that speaks pretty convincingly to the fact that a lot of these traditions must have also come from the mother language at a certain point. And again, you see this in names everywhere, right? So Eomer and Erwin from Lord of the Rings, that Eo is Old English, right? Philippos or Philip, horse lover. There's a Sanskrit Brahmin whose name was uh, Syavashva, he who has black horses. This shows up everywhere. Okay, so moving forward, um, let's talk a little bit about this proto-language we have. Now, this is a little bit complicated. We're not going to go through the details of this because we don't have time. But basically, by comparing evidence in the daughter languages, we can reconstruct what the original sounds were. So of note here, right, we have uh, unmarked stops. So pa, ta, kya, maybe ka or ka, and then kwa. We also have things called aspirated stops. So bha, dha, ga, gua, right, which you see a lot in Sanskrit. Um, anyone notice something weird about this? What sounds are missing? A sound set called fricatives, right? So sounds like zzz, fff, right? Don't exist here, which is kind of rare typologically, but they enter the daughter languages at different points. So to understand a little bit of why this is so important to us, right? We've reconstructed uh, different grades of the Indo-European verb by comparing data, right? So it looks like uh, they would have a, a verb root, so something like said, the reconstructed word to sit, and they would put an E in the middle, that means it was an E grade, it was used for certain tenses and certain words. So this E grade, said, or et cetera, said ske, et cetera, gives us Russian siest, right, sadhatas in Vedic Sanskrit, sedeo. It also gives us our sit, German sitzen. There was also something called an O grade, right? Where instead of the E, that in initial, that vowel in between was an O, right? So sod, we reconstructed a root sodeye, which means to cause to sit down. In Proto-Germanic, that gives us something like satyana, which gives us our sat, and also set, right? So maybe you can see where I'm going with this. There's also a zero grade where there's no vowel in between the words, right? So this would have given us English nest, 
interestingly enough, that ST there, which is originally from something like Nistos, or literally a place where a bird might sit. You see it also in Latin, Nidos, Kurdish, Nishtin, Welsh, etc. It shows up in a lot of different places. So why is this relevant, basically? Uh, this is where our verbs come from, right? This is why we have sing, sang, sung, things like that. So look at this root. We've reconstructed root seng, it's a mouthful, to mean sing, right, or to pronounce solemnly. So the E grade gives us our English sing. O grade eventually became sang. Zero grade, sung, something like that, gave us sung, right? Which is interesting, cool. But what's also great about this is that it explains a lot of irregularities in other languages as well. So let's see, anyone ever wondered why this is the case, right? None of these guys, all these different languages, right? They have a verb for is and a verb for are that they don't seem to be related to one another, right? So German ist and sind, right? Latin est and sunt, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what's interesting here is that actually using this understanding of E grade, O grade, zero grade, whatever, we can show these come from the same root. So the root hess looks like it meant to be, something like that. Uh, so looking at a conjugation paradigm, this is how we've reconstructed how to conjugate a verb in the present tense. I am, you are, he is, they are. What's important here is that this plural is in something called, is in the zero grade, right? So it becomes chsonti or something like that, as opposed to hesti. This, if anybody knows Greek or Lithuanian or Sanskrit, these look very similar to the daughter languages, right? So that first guy there. First, okay, the H1 disappears, so it just becomes esti or something like that. So in the singular, esmi becomes Latin esom, later becomes sum. It's also the origin of our word am, right? Aom becomes am, which comes from the same root. More importantly, let's look at the verb he is, though. So German ist, Latin s, Sanskrit asti, Polish jest. It's the same idea. Uh, now let's put it in the zero grade. Boom. Right? So when that H1 drops out, the verb became something like sonti, which became German sind, Latin sunt, Sanskrit asanti, Polish san. Right? This actually comes from the exact same root. Uh, it's just our, under, our uh, inability to have seen that verb alternation meant that we couldn't really tell that they were related. And you see this all over, right? If you study Indo-European, you'll find that words across all these languages you never think could be related to one another originally come from the same root. Okay, so a lot of technical stuff. I get it, it's a lot, but this, this is gonna give us our tools for moving forward, right? So let's look at some of the daughter languages, because that's sort of the glory of linguistics as well, right? Indo-European is great, it's fascinating to study these guys, but what's also important is that it shows us a lot of evidence about the living languages themselves. So let's look at the first one, Celtic, right? Anyone like asterisks? If, <laughs> great comic. Um, some of the major languages here, right? Irish, Welsh, I think some of you guys must speak these. A Little bit? You dabble? There you go. All right, so some interesting things in Celtic, which we know is an Indo-European language, right? It looks like all those initial P's dropped out. So we have father, they have ather, or something like that in, in Old Irish, right? Or yask becomes, uh, is fish, which in Latin would be pisces, right? Or something like that. Another bizarre thing in Celtic languages, and this is why they're so interesting to study, is something called uh, mutations, right? So in Celtic, a means, uh, can mean his, their, or her, depending on the context. Right, which is pretty bizarre. But what's weird is that when you put it in front of a word like tuath, people, clan, race, folk, whatever, that first sound changes. So a thuach, thuath is his people, but then a duath becomes their people, and then her people become a tuath. Right, so that first consonant is gonna mutate in seemingly random ways. You see this also here, right? So his fish would be a yask, but their fish becomes a nyask, her fish becomes a hyask. Right, my, my linguistics professor joked essentially that learning Old Irish is like mowing your lawn, because once you do it, you have to do it again next week. <laughs> right, so this is actually one of the mysteries that Indo-European linguistics uh, exposed, right? So we see, for example, I didn't talk about this too much below here, but for example, in Sanskrit, the, the pronoun they, I think is esham or something like that, it ends with a, a ma. And what's interesting is that for there as well here, we see this N sound popping up, right? So these mutations would seem very random, actually come from easily reconstructable sources in the mother language. Right, so another interesting thing about uh, Celtic quickly is that it looks like it was, uh, it's closely related to the Italic family. Languages like Latin, which eventually gave us French, Latin, Romanian, uh, Greek, you know, whatever, sorry. Spanish, Romanian, etc., and also other languages from ancient Italy. So we see this, for example, right? They have this verbal ending. So in Latin, sequitur, anyone know what that means? Yeah, right, that O-R ending. In, in Irish, it's shechether. Uh, and that vowel R ending exists pretty much only in this family and two others, which makes us think that these guys were particularly close before they started splitting up and going their separate ways. You see this also in nouns, right? So you have this uh, change where if you had a pa and a qua in a word, it became a qua and a qua. So Latin quinque, right, from a root that looked like penque. Uh, 
it just shows up in Irish coik, or actually the Welsh word pump, uh, because peas in Welsh all come from a qua earlier. Um, right, moving on, and then, okay, adjectives, you see the same thing, right? Latin to make a superlative, the most uh, strong, beautiful, sorry. Uh, it's bellissimus, right? And in, in, uh, from ancient Gaul, we have a god named bellissima, right? So there's all this evidence of features of shared innovations they share together, which speak to the fact that probably these two languages uh, have a, had a shared culture or a shared speaker society before they broke off in different directions. So another one briefly is Germanic, right? This is our favorite family. Just kidding. <laughs> Wait, so we've seen some cool things so far, right? So Germanic has sing, sang, sat, whatever, um, due to that E grade, that vowel alternation, right? Some other things that are noticeable about Germanic, though, is this thing called Grimm's Law. So we have an initial thing where in Indo-European, the stops, the sounds that have a stop of air in your mouth, ta, pa, ka, all became fricative. So th, fa, cha. So we see this right now, right? Our word three, but tres, trias in Sanskrit, et cetera. Or in five, right? Uh, five for us, but pentos in Greek. Same idea. Our word hundred in Latin is kentum, or Greek hekaton. We see this also with uh, these voice guys, right? So uh, everybody put your hand on your throat. Say zzz. Now say zzz. You see that, right? So that buzzing in your throat is called voicing, and that's a very simple way to distinguish two sounds in any language. Right, so our word kin is related to the Greek word genos, right, which gives us our gene, genetics, eugenics, et cetera, right? Uh, same idea here, right, so our soap is cognate with Latin sebum. There's a P and a B alternating there. Sebum in Latin is like fat or animal tallow. Uh, again, decum in Latin or deca in Greek becomes R10. So that's another obvious feature uh, that make the I guess make the Germanic languages um, noticeable, right? You see another thing too where these aspirated stops, the ba, da, whatever, um, become just plain stops. So what in Sanskrit would be bharami becomes our bear, or it becomes madhu becomes our mead. German steigen is cognate with Sanskrit stignoti, that g and then g alternation there. All right, last one because we're going through this kind of quickly. Anyone know the Indo-Aryan family? Does that sound familiar? Sound kind of weird, that second word there? Right, so actually in the history of linguistics, right, this is where the concept of the Aryan race came from. There was an, a, a, a huge theory back in the day that essentially um, when they discovered this, Europeans couldn't really accept that, uh, that the, the sort of uncivilized peoples of India could have had such a um, advanced language and culture, right? So there was a theory going around essentially that white people, uh, civilized people, brought the Sanskrit language to India and then established the caste system and the religion, et cetera, and things like that, right? Which is, and these guys were designated as the Aryas from a term in, uh, in Sanskrit text. So that gave us the idea of the Aryan race, right? Originally, the Aryan race were just the bearers of the Indo European language. We all know how that ended up. Um, right, okay, so think about Sanskrit. It collapses the entire vowel system to A, right? So when you hear Sanskrit, you can't help but think, like, these guys, it's just ah, 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 over and over and over. Another interesting feature is retroflex consonants. You see this in Hindi, Gujarati, plenty of languages today. These didn't exist in Indo European, right? Retroflex consonants are sounds like ta, da, na, et cetera. And it looks like whenever the original Sanskrit speakers came into India, they interacted with another language there that gave them these sounds, right? So there's sort of a historical detective case to do there. Um, Another cool thing, right? Uh, we can skip this, this is not that important. This is the cool thing I want to get to, <laughs> right? So we've reconstructed an Indo-European root bhaud, something like that. This is in the E grade. It's cognate with our word bid, bade, et cetera, right? So what would it be in the zero grade? Anyone know? Just delete the E. Bhud, yeah, cool. Now in Indo-European, we've reconstructed a, uh, an adjectival suffix to, which would mean something like the awakened one, right? He who has awakened. Now this is kind of interesting, right? There's another sound change where to goes to do. So at this point, sometime in early Indo-Aryan, we have a form like bhudho, someone who has woken up. I don't know if any of you are catching on yet, but. <laughs> now we apply Grassman's law, right? So when you have two aspirates, you're gonna shift that aspiration all the way to the end to that very last consonant. So what becomes bhudho or something like that? just shifts to the very last uh, consonant there. So buddha becomes buddha, right? You shift the vowel, you get buddha. Which is cool. <laughs> right, so moving through this, right? So how does this apply to you guys
as polyglots? Well, one, I think just this is really cool, right? This is great stuff to know because this, again, is a language which is a reconstructable culture with um, plenty of really fascinating stuff behind it. And that, I think, is, is reason enough. But here's another one, right? There are a lot of theories in linguistics that you can reconstruct higher level relations, that it's not just Indo-European in this family, but it's also others, right, that might be related to Turkish, to languages like Kartvelian in the Caucasus, or Afro-Asiatic with Semitic, et cetera. Jury's still out on it. There's a lot of problems with the theory. But you know what? If anyone's going to do it, if anyone has the passion and the understanding of languages and patterns, it's you guys. <laughs> now again, right? you guys as language learners, you have an interest in finding patterns and solving puzzles. That's why you're learning languages in the first place. Right? So here are some interesting puzzles from linguistics that we might be able to solve. Right? Did the Navajo people or did Native Americans in general originally come from Siberia? Right? There's a lot of genetic evidence. But it also looks like there might be linguistic evidence as well. Why does Chinese have tones, right? Why do we say horse, scold, whatever in a flat tone, but the Chinese say ma, 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 et cetera, right? It drives you crazy as a learner. Why does that exist? Well, it's a question we can answer with historical linguistics. Or much more simply, why did German and Russian have so many damn cases, <laughs> right? Or, I don't know, why does Russian stress seem so random? Or why do Russian verbs do this and this? But, right? All these are questions that we can answer through regular reconstruction of the mother language. So basically, as polyglots, the evidence is right in front of you. You just need to know how to think properly, right? How to attack those patterns and try and find an underlying logic to them. Now, last, another pitch for me, basically. If you study Indo-European, you can increase your vocabulary enormously in a lot of languages, right? I didn't know Latin or Sanskrit very well before starting to study this about 18 months ago, um, but it's helped me enormously. Right? Again, you can find underlying order in irregular patterns. So it can teach you to see language not as a bunch of random mutations here and there, but as an orderly, very well put together system that just through time has changed in different directions, like ist and sunt, things like that. Right? You can also understand languages you've never even heard of. <laughs> right? if, you know, if you know an Iranian language very well and you understand Indo-European, you can read other languages like, I don't know, yak nobi or tumshukis or whatever it is. Right? Cool cocktail trick. <laughs> The last one, you can also learn how modern languages take shape. And that's really fundamental, right? You can start to understand why our languages look the way they do, why we have these verbs, why we have these cases, other things like that, right? So that's about it. Um, right, and these are my uh, footnotes. Right, so I think we have time for a few minutes of questions, if, that's, uh, if anyone's interested. Yeah, hi. Um, oh, that was too close. <laughs> um, so at the beginning of your talk, you mentioned about um, linguistics and polyglots and how those are sort of different topics, like linguistics and language learning. But what I'm interested in knowing is I'm like a freshman in college. I'm really interested in languages. And I'm wondering whether to major in linguistics or to major in like a foreign language or two foreign languages, what would you recommend? Oh, it depends what your goals are, right? What you're, you're interested in. I think the best person to answer that is, is you, um, basically. I mean, if you're, if you're really interested in using languages in, in whatever, then, then go for languages. On the other hand, if you want to get to understand the science a bit better, uh, linguistics might be, might be the way to go. But they definitely complement one another. Hi. Um, thank you for your dissertation. It was Really, really interesting. My name is Laura. I have um, a question about the way you go about this research. Do you have informants? How do you go about the research or this puzzle thing that you do? And what are your sources? Thank you. Sure. Um, so there's actually a lot of really accessible literature out there, um, even just for lay people, to understand how historical linguistics can work. Right? In addition to that, I mean, I study this full time uh, at college. So it's, it's just kind of the, the experience of, of being bombarded with this every day. Um, but if you're interested, actually talk to me afterwards. And I can, I can point you in the direction of some sources if, you're, uh, if you'd like to know a little bit more. Oh, cool. Well, there you go. Um, yeah, I mean, also, again, if you studied a language like Greek or Sanskrit, you can see immediately that these match up with one another. Ah, sure, sure. I mean, uh, uh, this is, uh, at least on a basic level, a little bit more concerned with um, dead languages now, right? But if you, uh, there's a lot of research also done in modern languages, right? Lithuanian looks like it's probably the closest to the original Indo-European language in a lot of ways. So for that, yeah, it'd be, it's fantastic to get to talk to native speakers and see how they perceive their language. <laughs> 
Okay, um, I'm not gonna stir the pot, Sure. but what is your opinion on the Altaic languages? The Japanese, yeah, Korean, for sure. and if they're... You know, it's funny, it, so okay, actually... Okay, I'm gonna leave now. Uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question, right? So the Altaic languages, this is another proposed language family like Indo-European. Um, it's supposed to contain things like uh, Japanese and Korean, which as far as we know are isolates, languages like Mongolian, Manchurian, also all the Turkic languages. Um, it's funny, I asked my linguistics professor on the first day of class his opinion, and he goes, oh, it's complete bullshit. Um, my opinion, I don't really know. The jury seems to be out. Um, I think if you look at the literature, there's a lot of interesting stuff between Mongolian and Turkish. Japanese and Korean, I'm a little bit more hesitant on. But um, people have tried pretty thoroughly, actually, to reconstruct original roots for that language as well, with varying degrees of success. So I, uh, I had a question about where this stuff is going now. Um, do you think that languages are starting to like calcify with the advent of the internet? We write everything down. In information you know, can't be destroyed anymore. So do you think things are starting to lock in? Or do you think that this evolution that you talked about is happening and we'll get new languages? Well, I think the interesting thing is a lot of these, uh, so this language was obviously spoken by uh, a pre-literate society. And for a lot of these dead languages also, they were also pre-literate societies. So the spoken languages moved, uh, evolved a lot more than the written languages did, right? So you get, you know, for example, people were writing in Latin in Europe a thousand years after Latin died, right? And they were speaking French or Spanish or whatever, which for a long time they just thought was bad Latin before they realized it was a different language, right? No, it's, it's, it's true. Um, and... You know, to that extent, I think, it's, I think it's a really interesting question. I mean, we can't really stop language change, right? Different dialects, different circumstances, babies picking things up differently. It just, it naturally changes, and that's sort of an unstoppable thing. I think what's more interesting is, right, so you have an imposed sort of literary language, and that seems to be a lot more uh, steadfast in a lot of ways, right? People are still arguing about whether you can split infinitives or do things like that. Whereas the modern language itself, the spoken language, is just evolving in front of our eyes. Like, okay, what's the past tense of sneak, someone? So anyone say sneaked? Right, OK. So this actually, I've, I've seen, seems to be a generational divide. right? A lot of people who are over the age of 60 still say sneak, or 70 or so, right? Say sneaked, as opposed to snuck. Right? Stuck, snuck by itself is a modern innovation that we've really only developed in the last couple of decades through analogy. right? We see uh, whatever, sits at, things like that. We say uh, snuck, sneaked, or whatever it is. Um, so that's an example of how language is literally changing in front of our eyes, and different people have different forms on a small level, so yeah. Okay, this is gonna be our last question, unfortunately, so we can stick to time, but I'm sure Tim will be available afterwards to talk more about this. Has the field of linguistics gotten any closer to developing the original language, and is it believed there even was one that basically led to everything else? Uh, really good question, so as far, I mean, logically speaking, they're probably language arguably really only did come up once, or it may have come up several times. Yeah, if you were to look for far enough back into history, you'd probably see that a lot of modern languages that we can't prove are related are in fact related, right? There's a lot of evidence, inconclusive though, that Indo-European is related to a family like Uralic, which includes Finnish, other languages in, in Siberia and things like that. We can't quite prove it. To go back further than that though, right, the comparative method only brings us back to about 4,000 BC, right? Humans have probably had language for, what, 250,000 years, less than that. Um, Unfortunately, with the methods we have, we just can't go that far back enough, right? There's an, a theory in linguistics, essentially, that a language replaces its entire sound system roughly once every 10,000 years, probably a lot less than that, right? So at a certain point, you just can't find these correspondences anymore. And if nobody had written these things down in ancient Latin or Greek or whatever, it could have been the case that we really would have never figured this out, right? If the language had developed so much, we couldn't find where the original P's and F's and whatever, uh, you know, we would have been stuck. So we can go back far, but even going back to the Ice Age is pretty dubious uh, at this point. Thank you.